Part 3. McClaw's Attack When McClaw's and Hood's divisions took their positions on Seminary Ridge, the plan was for McClaw's to lead the attack north up Emmitsburg Road and for Hood's division to follow in support. But then the plan changed. They'd expected to attack a lightly occupied position, but instead found, as McClaw's said, a superior force in a strong position, unquote. So the four brigades in Hood's division attacked first, still hoping to get around the Union left and drive it in. General Hood was wounded early in the attack and carried off the field. The attack by Hood's division went east rather than up Emmitsburg Road, and 90 minutes passed. General Longstreet watched the attack go forward and stall. Several of Hood's brigade commanders appealed to Longstreet for help. General McClaws wrote that Longstreet wanted to wait until the heights of Devil's Den were taken. As we saw in Part 2, the capture of Devil's Den happened about an hour after the attack started. Before I start the animation, I'll show you an elevation profile from Google Earth. The line for this profile runs west to east from the corner of Wheatfield Road and Emmitsburg Road, across the summit of Little Round Top to Tawnytown Road. Here's the elevation profile, and again the, the vertical exaggeration is set by Google Earth. The most interesting thing to me is, notice how the wheat field sits in a valley between Stony Hill on the west and Hawks Ridge on the east. Also, notice that the peach orchard, at least where the line runs, is higher than Stony Hill. And finally, look at how deep the valley at Plum Run is. This is a very complicated, twisty landscape. And then it's complicated further by the fact that parts of it are rocky and parts of it are wooded. Seems to me advantage to the defender. And I would not want to be an infantry guy down in that wheat field. Just saying. So let's turn to the animation. Notice the timers to the right and left. Again, the times are my best guess. Credit to James Woods and his book, Gettysburg July 2, when the map is correct, and blame me when it's not. The four brigades in McClaw's division are highlighted in red. You see Kershaw, Barksdale, Semmes, and Wofford. And they attacked in this order. One, two, three, and four. Notice the third corps position. There were two brigades holding the south leg of the 3rd Corps salient, de Trobriand and Ward. General Meade sent Barnes's 5th Corps division with three brigades to build this up, and Vincent's brigade ended up going left to Little Round Top, and Schweitzer's and Tilton's went right to Stony Hill. Ninety minutes after the fighting started, Gaps were starting to show up in the Union line. First, here at Devil's Den, Ward's brigade was retreating, which left Vincent's brigade all alone on Little Round Top. To the right, de Trobriand's brigade was holding on with two 5th Corps brigades as reinforcements, but both flanks of their position were exposed. General Longstreet was watching the progress of Hood's division and their attack. As Stephen Sears wrote in his book, Gettysburg, General Longstreet had gauged the progress of Hood's offensive, and when he saw it reaching its limits, and saw the enemy fully committed to Hood's front, he determined to send in McClaw's division. Unquote. Kershaw's brigade led the attack. Makowski, White, Davis, in their book, Don't Give an Inch wrote that Kershaw planned to attack Stony Hill with the center of his brigade and the Peach Orchard on its left rear. Kershaw was hoping to exploit the gap in the Third Corps line and open a western approach to the wheat field. Also about this time, the Confederate regiments attacking Little Round Top have failed in attacking the center, and they shifted to attacking the left and right flanks of Vincent's brigade. And see here Anderson's brigade, in the left wing of Robertson's brigade, have moved up to the south edge of the wheat field. General Kershaw expected Barksdale's brigade to attack with him. Notice that did not happen. 
About ten minutes into the attack, because Barksdale had not come up on his left to deal with the Union artillery in the Peach Orchard, Kershaw split his brigade. Half to attack the Peach Orchard, the other half to continue the attack on Stony Hill. Also, notice Tilton's brigade starting to fall back. This exposed the flank of the next brigade to the east, Schweitzer's brigade, and the whole Union line at that point fell back to Wheatfield Road. Just about this time, Sem's brigade started their attack. They moved forward to try to close the gap between Kershaw's and Anderson's brigades. Notice that another 5th Corps division had started forward to help. This was Ayers' division, with Weed's brigade in the lead. Weed's brigade will reinforce Vincent on Little Round Top, and they're approaching on Tawnytown Road, just now turning off onto Wheatfield Road. About 6 p.m., a division from 2nd Corps was sent forward. This was Caldwell's division, with four brigades. General Caldwell was told to report to General Sykes, commander of 5th Corps. On Little Round Top, the attack on Vincent's right failed. And today you can see a monument at Little Round Top that commemorates the counterattack by Colonel O'Rourke and the 140th New York at this point. Philip Lano in his book, Gettysburg Campaign Atlas, wrote, Meade's left is in serious trouble, unquote. Three divisions from three different corps were now committed to the southern leg of the 3rd Corps salient. That's Burney's division from 3rd Corps, Barnes's division from 5th Corps, and Caldwell's division from 2nd Corps. The Confederates control the Wheatfield and Rose Woods, and they've driven in the center and left of the 3rd Corps line and are threatening to attack both the rear of Humphrey's division and to roll up Meade's line on Cemetery Ridge. General Caldwell, who was with his division coming south to reinforce the Union left, found problems with a lack of unified command. General Sykes, the 5th Corps commander, was on Little Round Top. General Sickles, 3rd Corps commander, was at the Trossel Farm. General Burney, a 3rd Corps division commander, was leading a countercharge into the wheat field. And General Barnes, commander of a 5th Corps division, sent to reinforce was nearby, but unwilling to take the initiative. About this time, a cloud of dust was spotted in the Union rear on Baltimore Pike. Was it cavalry? Had General Stewart suddenly popped up in the Union rear? Meade's headquarters was located about here where you see the Red X. Harry Fans in his book, Gettysburg the Second Day, quoted a report written by the war correspondent Charles Carlton Coffin. So they've spotted dust coming up Baltimore Pike. There were anxious countenances around the cottage where the flag of the commander-in-chief was flying. Officers gazed with their field glasses. It is not cavalry, but infantry, said one. There's the flag. It is the Sixth Corps. We could see the advancing bayonets gleaming in the sunlight. Faces which a moment before were grave became cheerful. It was an inspiring sight. Unquote. As Caldwell's Second Corps Division was approaching, moving south from Cemetery Ridge, General Burney, the Third Corps Division commander, was concerned about Confederate gains on his flank and rear. General Burney asked de Trobriand's brigade to advance, and he learned they were out of ammunition. He asked them to fix bayonets and then led them forward into the wheat field. Zook's brigade was at the rear of the Caldwell Division column when a Third Corps staff officer rode up and he took them off to the northwest corner of the wheat field. Cross's brigade was at the front of Caldwell's column. They were sent in first and entered the wheat field, first in and will be first out. At this point, the wheat field and little round top situations were improving for Meade. Two divisions from 5th Corps had reinforced the Union position, and 6th Corps were on the doorstep. But also soon, Barksdale's and Wofford's Confederate brigades will attack the Peach Orchard, and moving Caldwell's division opened a gap in the Union line between 2nd Corps and 3rd Corps. Anderson's division, further north, will attack that gap. 
A big artillery battle started around the time Hood's division began their attack. Confederate artillery on Seminary Ridge were dueling with Union artillery around the Peach Orchard. McClaw's division was suffering because a lot of the Union shells were landing on their positions. They had to hunker down while their commanders waited for the orders to move forward. General Barksdale was anxious to attack, watching his brigade sit passive, suffering under the artillery, and he approached his boss, General McClaws. General, let me go. General, let me charge. He was told no. Barksdale then approached Longstreet. I wish you would let me go in, General. I would take that battery in five minutes. Longstreet's reply, Wait a little. We are all going in presently. Godfrey quoted General Barksdale telling his men that officers below the rank of general would attack on foot because of the difficulty of replacing the horses killed, unquote. Now, Barksdale launched his attack. Anderson's division, from Hill's Corps to the north, was supposed to go at the same time as Barksdale, but actually started about five minutes later. And at about this time to the east, see the Union Sixth Corps starting to arrive. They're crossing Rock Creek. In the last remaining Fifth Corps division, which is Crawford's division, with Fisher and McCandless's brigades, was now moving south. Zook's brigade followed Cross's brigade into the wheat field. Remember, Zook was at the rear of Caldwell's column and was grabbed and diverted by a Third Corps staff officer. Zook's brigade attacked from the northwest as de Trobriand's brigade was withdrawn. And then Kelly's brigade entered between Cross and Zook. Cross's brigade in the wheat field ran out of ammunition. Brooks' brigade, the last of Caldwell's four brigade division, was waiting in reserve, so they were ordered in to relieve Cross. Barksdale, the third of McClaws's four brigades, crossed Emmitsburg Road, and in their front, Graham's brigade began to retreat. So at this point, on the U.S. side, the V Corps was fully committed and the VI Corps was arriving. On the Confederate side, Hood's division held Devil's Den, and they were threatening the wheat field, but never really captured it. McClaw's division, see them highlighted in red, was now fully engaged at the Rose Farm, the Peach Orchard, and the wheat field. Anderson's division was now moving toward Emmitsburg Road, and I'll cover that in Part 4. Brooks' brigade moved into the wheat field from the north, and joined Zook's and Kelly's brigades, and the three Union brigades from Caldwell's division pushed Kershaw's and Anderson's brigade and Robertson's left wing back from their line at the Peach Orchard and the Wheat Field. On Little Round Top, fighting continued on Vincent's left flank, and this is the famous defense by Colonel Joshua Chamberlain in the 20th Maine. Willard's brigade began to move south, led personally, by General Hancock, the Second Corps commander. James Woods has the wounding of General Sickles happen right around this time. The location he was wounded was probably near the Trossel Barn, marked with an X. So Sickles is down. There were two divisions in Third Corps. Humphrey's division was the west leg of the Third Corps salient, and Burney's division was the south leg. General Sickles appointed General Burney to take over as 3rd Corps commander, and then General Meade, who of course is Sickles' boss, as soon as he heard Sickles had been carried off the battlefield, appointed General Hancock, 2nd Corps commander, to take over 3rd Corps. At just about this time, Wofford's brigade, the last of the McClaws Division brigades, launched their attack. And two great quotes are reported here by Bradley Godfrey in his book. A gap appeared between regiments as the brigade passed through the rebel artillery line, and General Wofford rode over waving his hat to urge them on. And Godfrey reports that a battery commander, Captain W. W. Parker, yelled out, Hurrah for you of the bald head! And Parker's cry was echoed up and down the line, Hurrah for you of the bald head! And then General Longstreet rode out part of the way with the brigade and told the men to Cheer less and fight more, unquote. To the south, Burbank and Day's brigades, among the last of the 5th Corps reinforcements to arrive, crossed Plum Run moving west. 
A few minutes later, Wofford's brigade crossed Emmitsburg Road and Barksdale's brigade started to turn north, while Anderson's division, to the north, started to cross the road. Humphrey's division was ordered by General Burney to retreat. So wait, but Meade put Hancock in charge of Third Corps. My guess is it took some time for word to go up and down the line, so at this point, Burney was still in charge. Humphreys was a West Pointer. Humphreys had skirmishers out in front of his division, wanted to counterattack, and was furious with the order to retreat. Burney, like Sickles, was a lawyer and a political general, and I'm wondering why Sickles chose Burney rather than Humphreys to take command. General Humphreys, following an order he did not like, apparently led a very tenacious fighting withdrawal back and uphill to the new line that was forming on Cemetery Ridge. The attack in the wheat field by Caldwell's division lost momentum. Schweitzer's brigade moved south back into the wheat field, ordered forward by Barnes and Caldwell to support Caldwell's 2nd Corps division. Brooks' brigade crossed Rose Run, attacking to the southwest, and was stalled by Semmes' brigade. Zook's and Kelly's brigades were also stopped on Stony Hill. This is a high point for the Federals in the wheat field. With Confederate troops forced away from the wheat field and off of Stony Ridge, and then Wofford's brigade struck. Caldwell's division was drawn into the wheat field and then they were struck on the flank and rear by Wofford's brigade. All the Federal brigades in the wheat field began to retreat. Four Confederate brigades, Wofford, Kershaw, Semmes, and Anderson, renewed their attack on the wheat field and Peach Orchard. Now there was nothing between Willard's brigade on the north and Burbank and Day's two brigades at the wheat field on the south. You'll see other blue icons in that gap, but those are all brigades that are already defeated. Edwin Connington in his book, The Gettysburg Campaign, referring to the delayed attack by McClaw's division, wrote, By luck or good generalship, Longstreet turned the delay into an advantage threatening double envelopment. Unquote. But see the mass of troops waiting in the Union rear along Rock Creek. That, of course, is the Sixth Corps. It's the end of a very long day for them. It's 7 p.m. Temperature was probably in the mid-70s or higher. They've been marching nonstop for 19 hours and 35 miles. Are these fresh troops? Probably not. But there are a lot of them. Maybe 14,000 when they left Manchester, Maryland. Probably not quite that many right now, but no doubt they hear the gunfire and artillery, and maybe they see smoke over the ridge to the west, and no doubt they were ready to join the fight. Now you can see brigades moving forward. That's Wheaton's division of 6th Corps. They were ordered to Little Round Top as the wheat field position was collapsing. Between 7 p.m. and 8 p.m., most of the 6th Corps was moved forward to reinforce the wheat field. Willard's brigade was attacking west against Barksdale's brigade on Cemetery Ridge. Burbank's Union brigade began moving west into the wheat field, and the left flank of Vincent's brigade, which is the 20th Maine, counterattacked. About this same time, Fisher's brigade arrived and deployed just east of Vincent's flank. And they arrived just as the fighting was ending but soon enough to exchange a few shots with the retreating rebel infantry. Now there were only two Union brigades left in the wheat field. Burbank's brigade had moved forward. Schweitzer's brigade found rebel troops in their rear and retreated, and Burbank's brigade also began to retreat. Soon all Federal units were pushed out of the wheat field, and to the north on Cemetery Ridge, Willard's brigade, collided with Barksdale's brigade. Barksdale began to retreat. See here that more 6th Corps brigades were moving, plus Lockwood and Ruger's brigades from 12th Corps were moving toward the Peach Orchard. They're the first of five 12th Corps brigades 
moved south away from Culp's Hill, and more on that in Part 5. Wofford's attack reached its peak near the north end of Little Round Top about 7.30 p.m. See the 6th Corps brigades arriving northeast of Little Round Top as McCandless's brigade begins moving forward. Wofford and Semmes's brigades began to retreat. To summarize to this point, Longstreet's division attacked with eight brigades. On the Union side, the fight involved the entire 3rd and 5th Corps and most of the 12th Corps, plus a division of the 2nd Corps. The fighting was epic and on a grand scale. In Mikowski White Davis's book, it is written, The action in the wheat field sapped the momentum of the Confederate assault. As more and more units poured into the wheat field, by default, fewer were available to strike at Devil's Den, Little Round Top, and ultimately up the Emmitsburg Road toward the increasingly vulnerable Federal Center. In comparison, the fight for Little Round Top was a skirmish compared to the battle in the wheat field, and the latter had a longer and more meaningful impact on the ultimate outcome of the battle." Unquote. Next, Part 4, Anderson's Attack. <laughs>